You are not fooling anybody when you say that what happened was a natural disaster. You're lying. It was not an earthquake. It wasn't a typhoon. Because what's really happening is that you're hiding something out there. And it is going to send us back to the Stone Age. Hey, so I saw Godzilla this weekend, and this is a movie that has divided a lot of people. Um, I haven't seen very many people who outright hated it, but for the most part, people seem to be divided into liked it or meh. I'm pretty firmly in the liked it camp, and I'm sure that may surprise those of you who are in the meh group, but you know what? I thought it was really good. Um, I think it could have been better. There's a lot of things that could have been done better, which I'll get to in just a minute, but overall I thought it was pretty solid. And I'm very happy that we finally have an American Godzilla movie that doesn't suck. I'm looking at you, Mr. Emmerich. But anyway, uh, quick and dirty plot summary. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, we have uh, Joe Brody, played by Brian Cranston, and he and his wife are working at a nuclear power plant in Japan. And one day, there's this horrible earthquake type of incident, although it's a very unusual earthquake for some science-y technobabble reason. And in any case, this results in some damage to the plant, which causes a nasty accident that kills off a few of the workers, one of which, unfortunately, is Joe's wife. And as you might expect, he's not terribly happy about this. And... Of course, the plant gets closed down, the entire island is quarantined, and the whole thing is blocked off. And then we fast forward to the present day, where Joe's son, Ford, who is played by Kickass, what's his real name? Aaron Taylor Johnson. I, I, I need to stop calling him Kickass. <laughs> like, but, you know, he's going to be known for that. But anyway, anyway, Ford has grown up and is doing quite well for himself. He's a uh, career military guy doing quite well there. He's uh, apparently married to the other Olsen sister. Uh, not one of the twins, but apparently they have another one, Elizabeth Olsen, who is, turns out, is a much better actress of the family, but yeah, they have a kid of their own. He's doing quite well, but his father, however, has not been handling the last 15 years well, and in fact, he keeps trying to sneak back onto the island in order to find some old data that he collected, because he is convinced that it wasn't no ordinary earthquake, and that them nasty government types have been covering it up. Bust out the tinfoil hats, everyone. So, his son has to fly to Japan to bail his ass out of jail, again, and this time... He manages to convince his son to go with him on one last run to try to sneak onto the island and get his old data disk, which he is certain will prove his theory that this was all a massive cover-up. And sure enough, it turns out he was right, because they get to the island and they find out it's not crawling in radiation, it's just fine. And there is also some super-secret science installation on the island where they are examining something where the power plant used to be. And they're discovered by the security forces and briefly taken prisoner. But while they are, the, uh, the big thing that they're researching turns out to be this bizarre cocoon of some sort. And it starts to hatch, and they realize that whatever's going to hatch out of this thing is probably going to be very large and very dangerous, and it's going to cause a lot of trouble. So they decide to zap it with a shitload of electricity to try to kill it. This, of course, does not work, and the big creature, which is known as a Muto, uh, which is not a monster from a classic Godzilla movie, as far as I know. This is a brand new creation, although it, a lot of people have said it does resemble the Cloverfield monster, and yeah, I guess it kind of does, but in the Godzilla universe, it's a brand new monster. And... It hatches out of the cocoon and goes on a rampage, and 
eventually uh, it finds another MUTO, which has been secretly kept in some storage facility for nuclear waste in Las Vegas. Or It wasn't actually in Las Vegas, it was in the outskirts, I think, but somewhere in Nevada. And they decide it's time to get it on and spread their little mutant babies all over the planet and just generally start wrecking shit up. And this brings attention to Godzilla, whose job it is apparently to destroy these massive beasts and put nature back in balance or some silly reason like that. It's, you know, whatever we need to get the monsters fighting, I'm all for it. A couple of the major complaints that I've seen from some other reviewers and also from a few commenters on various websites is that Godzilla is in a relatively small chunk of the movie and most of the film focuses on the human characters. I expected this going in because while I haven't seen every Godzilla movie out there, I have seen a few of the classic ones and that's pretty standard fare actually. Like in most of the Godzilla movies, the humans were the focus. You know, Godzilla was just, you know, either this mysterious villain who isn't revealed until the very end, or even the movies where he's the hero, he's still not in most of the movie. So I expected that. I expected a very slow build, and honestly, I was happy with the slow build. Because, really, it just makes the final battle, when you finally do see Godzilla and the two Mudos getting on, that it makes that much more satisfying in the end. And... And for what it's worth, that battle was awesome when they finally do turn the monsters loose near the last, like, 20 minutes or so of the movie. I enjoyed the hell out of that. Especially the final death blow, which I'm not going to say too much about, just in case anyone hasn't seen it yet that's watching this, but... Oh, that was brutal. Oh, very well done. Yeah, the... Who, who directed this? Gareth Edwards. He did a fantastic job with this movie. The whole thing is very well shot. The monster effects are very well done. This was a very solid effort as far as visuals and special effects and cinematography and all that. Um, now, while I am okay with the slow build, the way that they handled the slow build, there were, there were certain bits that did kind of start to annoy me after a while because, you know, when, when they first have Godzilla rise out of the sea and challenge one of the MUTOs, you know, but you see both of the monsters after they've, you know, some, a few buildings have been destroyed and they're about to fight and then it immediately cuts to the aftermath. And you just see some news footage of what's left and maybe a few clips of the fight that you just missed. And, you know, the first time this happened didn't bother me, but it keeps happening again and again and again. And I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be a way to do this that's not as cock tease ish <laughs> for lack of a better word. It's just, there There had to be a better way. I know there's a better way because they've done it in better ways in, their, in other Godzilla movies. So, yeah, it's it, it didn't completely take me out of the movie and I still liked it overall, but yeah, that's one thing I wish they had done better. Um, also... Brian Cranston's character gets minor spoiler alert here, just to warn you guys, but um, his character is featured very prominently in the trailer. Pretty much all the scenes you see him in in the trailer are all of his scenes from the movie. He's only in, like, maybe a third of it, and then he gets killed off. And I really wish they had kept him around for more of the movie. I mean, granted... As far as, you know, the action scenes go, there's not a whole lot he could have done. I mean, his son is the military guy, and he is the one who ends up doing a lot of the action, which makes sense. You know, it, it makes sense that a younger guy would do more of the action, and I wouldn't expect Brian Cranston to be an action star by any means, but I still think there had to have been more he could have done. And he was a much, much more interesting character. And I also really liked... Uh, the, uh, the Japanese scientist who was, what was the character's name? Dr. Ishiro Serizawa. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a character named Serizawa in the very first Godzilla film way back in the day. So, nice little reference there. Um, 
But yeah, he's played by Ken Watanabe, who also does a very good job in this movie. He's also a very interesting character. Um, does not get killed off right away, but still is just kind of relegated to the background and really wish there was more of him in this movie as well. Instead, pretty much the whole thing just focuses on on kick-ass. <laughs> Aaron Taylor Johnson. I, I will try to call him by his real name and not just by kick-ass. I'm sorry. But, uh, but yeah, and he's just not nearly as interesting as Cranston and Watanabe. And it's not his fault. He's, he's a decent enough actor. It's just his character is just very stock. There's not really a lot for him to do as far as, you know, character development and whatnot. He just has to play the role of the very by-the-numbers military action hero, and it's just, there was room for more in there. Another problem I had with this movie, and Pacific Rim did the exact same thing. I don't know what it is with these big Japanese monster movies and the terms analog and digital. But like Pacific Rim, this movie gets them wrong. The people who made this movie clearly do not know what these terms mean. Like, if, if you don't remember Pacific Rim, or if you haven't seen it, um, at some point in the movie they encounter this monster that has the ability to uh, shoot out EMPs, electromagnetic pulses, which kills all of their big battle mechs because they are they run on electricity, and as soon as they get hit with the EMP, everything just shuts down, and they're defenseless. But they have this older mech, and they say, well, you know, the newer mechs are all digital, so they can't survive the EMP, but this older one is powered by a nuclear reactor. It's analog. So the EMP won't affect it. But that's not what digital and analog means. And also, if it's nuclear, it's still electrical, so it's still susceptible to the EMP. And there was a workaround for this. All they had to say was, you know, something to the effect of, well, this thing has a nuclear reactor, so of course it's got better shielding because you don't want the reactor to cook the pilots. Maybe that shielding will be strong enough to hold off the EMP. And it might not have been 100% sound science, but at least they wouldn't have gotten the basic definitions of these terms wrong. It would have been much better. This movie does something similar because uh, the Mudos also, or at least one of them does. I don't think they both do, but they, the, uh, the female Mudo does at least. They have the ability to also shoot out EMPs because science, techno babble, wibbly wobbly, whatever. And it, it's a monster movie. This th these things happen. And so they. They come up with this plan to lure them out into the middle of the ocean and blast them with this huge nuclear weapon. And even though they seem to feed off nuclear energy, they reason that the force of the blast alone should be enough to wipe them out, regardless of whether they can feed on the nuclear power or not. And because they constantly emanate EMPs, they know that if they use a traditional electronic trigger, it's not going to work. So they replace it with an old clockwork timer and detonator to set off the bomb. But again, like Pacific Rim, they say that the old electronic triggering mechanism is digital and this clockwork one is analog. No, 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 it's not what that means. Just because it's not electrical doesn't mean it's analog. VHS is an analog format, but VCRs are still powered by electricity. And also, the display on this analog detonator is digital. So it's not freaking analog, even if it is mechanical. And all they had to do was just replace digital and analog with electrical and mechanical and it would have been fine. I, I, I want to know what idiot did this market research that said people respond to the terms digital and analog and slap him until the stupid falls out because it's because of him that everyone's going to get the definitions of these words wrong from here on out. Just, ugh. I know it's a stupid thing to complain about, but just... 
It, it's such an easy mistake to fix. I mean, hell, they could probably fix it just with a quick dub. Uh, and, and it would be more true to the crappy English dubs of the old Godzilla movies. <laughs> so even if it doesn't match up well, doesn't matter. Go with it. But uh, yeah, so those were... Those were my complaints for the movie, but, you know, beyond that, you know, I like the slow build-up to the fights. I like the big monster fights themselves. I really like the look of the Mudos and Godzilla in this movie. Uh, and I also really liked how he was really the hero of this movie. I mean, um, not kick-ass. <laughs> Aaron Taylor Johnson's character is kind of, sort of, the secondary hero, but really it's Godzilla that ends up saving the day. And, you know, he's... You see the trailer, you might think that it's kind of him versus the humans, but it's really not. In fact, there's a scene pretty early on when, uh, after the Mudos have gone to meet each other and start making babies in the Nevada desert, or what... No, no, actually, it's... They end up moving away from Nevada because Godzilla shows up, but they go to San Francisco and which gets leveled by the time this movie is over. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, and while Godzilla is swimming through the Pacific Ocean, he is surrounded by all these naval battleships and aircraft carriers and all that, and he's just not paying them any mind at all. He just keeps swimming in the same direction, just like, yeah, whatever. I'm not here for you. I'm here to kill the Mudos. Stay out of my way and no one gets hurt. And the only time he does deliberately attack humans is when they're dumb enough to start shooting at him. That's it. And yeah, and he is so very awesome in this movie. And I hope they make more. They, they, they leave, there's not any actual sequel bait in the movie, but they do leave the door open for a sequel. And from what I've heard, they're already making plans for it. And I'm looking forward to that because I want to see more of this. This was fun. This was a whole lot of fun. Um, as far as whether I would recommend this, I would say yes, but you have to know what you're getting into. If you're expecting another Pacific Rim, where it's pretty much just, you know, big monsters going at it throughout the entire movie, you're going to be a little disappointed because that's not what this is. It's much more akin to the older Godzilla films where it's a slower build and the monsters don't really get to cut loose and beat the ever-loving shit out of each other until the end. So, and there is a big focus on the human characters because it really is just as much their story as it is Godzilla's. So, if you know that going in and you're okay with this, then I really think you will enjoy it. Um, I think it's worth paying full price for. I can't really comment on whether it's worth paying the 3D price because I saw it in 2D, and I haven't really heard much one way or the other on whether the 3D in this movie was any good or not. I know it's a post-conversion, at least partially. I mean, all the stuff with Godzilla and the Mudos, that's all CG, so you don't have to post-convert that. That can all be done in rendering, so... That part of it might be true 3D, but anything involving actual physical objects and the human characters is all going to be post-converted. So, all depends on how good a job they did with it, but, I mean, it, it, it looks well enough in 2D. So, well, oh, and one more thing. Uh, this is actually something that I wanted to mention in my Amazing Spider-Man 2 vlog, and I forgot about it. So, I'm going to say it here, because really... It, it pertains to any film, and it just happened to affect my experience with Amazing Spider-Man 2, and, and also Godzilla, but to a much lesser extent. Um, if you are going to take your kids to see Amazing Spider-Man 2, or Godzilla for that matter, I see no problem with this. It's a PG-13 movie, but it's, you know, fairly tame for the most part. There's, you know, not blood and guts flying everywhere. There's not really that much in the terms of, you know, bad, naughty language or anything like that. Uh, yeah, for, for the most part, it's, it's kid-friendly enough that as long as your kids are fairly mature, they, they should be able to handle it just fine. But if you take your kids to see either of these movies, please do everyone in that theater a favor and make sure they understand the important rule 
that when you go to the movies, you must shut the fuck up. You don't necessarily have to word it that way, but please make sure they understand that rule because it, at the end of Amazing Spider-Man 2, when I think I can get into spoilers at this point, the movie's been out long enough, when Gwen Stacy dies, you know, of course there were, you know, the natural shocked reactions and questions from the get. Oh, oh, did she die? Did she die? Oh, oh, she just died. Oh, and on and on. It's like, that, you know, no big deal. Kids are going to do that kind of thing. But they would not shut up for the entire rest of the movie. And, and yeah, it was only like, you know, five minutes after that. But, God, it, you know, it got to the point where there are, you know, people in the theater are just you know, trying to very politely and quietly just shh, trying to quiet them down. Nope, they're not quieting down at all. We're looking back at the parents like, hey, uh, mom, dad, you want to help us out here? You want to? No, no, you're not going to. No, you're a shitty parent. You don't care. Okay, well, fuck you too. <sighs> yes. You know, if it's just the one offhand quiet comment here and there, that's no big deal. But if they're talking nonstop for minutes at a time, shut them the fuck up. Seriously, shut your kids the fuck up. Do your job as a parent. That's all I'm saying. Please and thank you. So one more thing before I sign off here. Um, as some of you have pointed out to me, uh, that guy with the glasses is uh, currently doing a, a talent pickup. And I know I've seen many comments uh, for as long as I've been doing this saying, hey, why isn't this guy on that guy with the glasses and all that? But uh, so I need to ask you guys a question. If I was to submit my work to that guy with the glasses in the hopes of getting picked up by them. What would I submit? What video do you think I've done that is the best example of cinematic excrement? Like, what's, what's the best episode that I've done that I can show them and say, hey, this is what I do? Because if there's anything I've learned over the years, I am a horrible judge of my own work. I, I have put out videos where I'm thinking, man, this really is not my best work. And then I get comments that say, oh my God, this is the best one you've done yet. Like, really? Okay, whatever. So, so I need to know what you think is the best one I've done. What, what was worth submitting? So let me know in the comments, send me a tweet, whatever. I want to know what you think. And that's it. So till next time, take care.